speaking for the uh, for the seminar, you're acknowledging that your image may be cut, may may be uh, captured in the recording. So today, it's my pleasure to introduce Eva Oberger, who's from Boku in um, in Austria in Vienna, and I've known Eva for a few years now, many years in fact, and uh, we be, we work together on a project called Route to Resilience, um, but. Eva is also a current holder of an ERC fellowship, which investigates the links between plant metabolism, root exudation, and rhizosphere processes, with a particular focus on barley. So, hence why she's talking here today. So, she's developed lots of um, techniques to look at how um, exudates impact soils in the rhizosphere. And uh, she'll be telling us today a bit about some of the work she's been doing recently on barley on the acquisition of uh, microelements or micronutrients in the, from the rhizosphere. So, um, Evie has, um, ha has worked in lots of different places around the world. So, she's worked in the University of South Australia in, in Australia and uh, University of Riverside in California, but also did some work at University of Bangor in the UK. And like I say, she's been working with us um, collaboratively for the last couple of years. So. Evie, uh, if you'd like to take the stage and uh, just shout when you want your slides moving on. So, thank you. Okay, thanks for the very warm welcome and the kind words, Tim. Um, and also apologies for this mess regarding um, the sharing the presentations, but WebEx really doesn't like me, it seems. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Thanks a lot. And um, considering the audience, um, I also always feel the need to point out that I'm actually a soil scientist by training. However, I've worked at this um, plant soil microbe interface for quite some years now, and that made me realize that simply just looking at the soil is not enough, but it's also not enough to just look at the plants. So you're going to, I'm going to present you some plant data, but I'm also going to present you some soil data in this talk. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. I don't see my next slide. Okay. So, um, the topic of today's talk, or in this talk, I would like to take you on a revisit of a micronutrient acquisition pathway, um, the so-called phytosiderophil pathway. Um, but before I dive into this topic, I would like to talk a bit about what motivated my work or what motivated me on working on this topic. And the main motivation is actually a huge global challenge that we are facing. And this global challenge is called the hidden hunger. And the hidden hunger means that um, you may have sufficient food in terms of quantity, but the quality of the food that you eat is not good enough to meet your nutritional demands. So as it happens of today, about 2 billion people suffer from micronutrient malnutrition. And I think that's quite scary, so to say. And especially iron and zinc are, are a problem here. And this micronutrient malnutrition causes severe developmental problems, especially for children. And it's also a huge issue for, for pregnant women. So those are the people that are affected the most. And as you can see from these two maps that I plotted here, um, that on the left, the map on the left hand side shows the human zinc deficiency in the map on the right hand side. So it shows um, the global soil deficiency, so to say, we can see that there is a geographical overlap um, of the areas that are affected most. Um, and this means that the crops that grow um, on these soils in these areas simply do not take up enough micronutrients to meet the, the, the people's demands. So, of course, we can fertilize our soil and we can buy supplements and, and get our micronutrients from them. But I mean, it's quite obvious that this costs money. So this means that, um, especially in the poor areas of the world, people don't have these kind of solutions. So we believe that developing micronutrient rich crops is the most sustainable solution to tackle this hidden hunger problem. Next slide, please. So what are phytosiderophores and how do they, what, what role do they play when it comes to micronutrients? So, about in the 1980s, um, these the so-called iron acquisition mechanisms were discovered. So there, there is a difference between grass species and non-grass species. So for non-grass species, um, they are also referred to as strategy two, 
uh, sorry, strategy one um, species, they rely when it comes to iron acquisition on the release of protons and then the release of um, complexing and, and reducing agents that mobilize iron in the rhizosphere. And then the plant reduces iron three to iron two at the root surface and takes up iron two. However, all grass species rely on the release of these so-called phytosiderophores. And these phytosiderophores are non-proteinous amino acid-like compounds, so metabolites, that are released by the plants from via the roots into the soil. And they mobilize iron and other micronutrients in the soil. And then the plant takes up the entire iron phytosiderophore complex. And these phytosiderophores are also the reason, or this mechanism, this strategy two mechanism is also the reason why grass species typically grow better under iron deficient condition or in iron deficient soils compared to non-grass species. Can you press next, please? So these micronutrient deficiencies especially occur in high pH calcareous soils. And the reason for this is that micronutrient solubility in these soils is really low. Um, and when the solubility is low, this also means that plant availability is low. So while in terms of total amounts, enough micronutrients might be there, they are simply not plant available. And these high pH soils make up about a third of the world's um, arable soils. So it's quite, it's quite some areas that are affected by this. Can you go next, please? So, as I said, this strategy two mechanism, so this phytosiderophore pathway that was discovered in the 1980s. So we do know quite some things about this um, pathway. Um, however, the knowledge that we have is still rather sketchy and I will tell you, I'll give you a reason why that is the case. But first, let's focus on what we know. So we know that um, there are eight plant born phytosiderophores from the mucinate acid family. They are structurally rather similar. Um, you don't need to remember the structure. You also don't need to remember the specific names. Just remember that whenever I say something like DMA, MA, EpiHMA, or AVA, HAVA, I'm talking about a phytosiderophore. That's all you need to remember. Next, please. Um, and next again, please. What we also know is, for example, for DMA is that um, it has a, a high complex affinity for iron, but not just for iron, but also for other trace metals, like, for example, copper. So if you look at these complex stability constants that were determined in the late 1980s here, just for DMA, you can see that the metal stability complex constant for copper is actually higher than that for iron. And this might have implications for the plants and what these phytosiderophores can actually do for the plants. And this also somehow suggests that maybe um, phytosiderophores could play a role in copper nutrition or, for example, in zinc nutrition as well, though the zinc complex stability constant is lower than that for iron and for copper. Can you go next? Another thing that we know is that different grass species release different mixes of, of um, phytosiderophores. So not every grass species releases all the eight fighters are there for some just release one, some release, I don't know, two or three. It really depends. Um, and that's also something that has been shown quite some time ago. Can you go next? Um, and another thing, I think now my slides are a bit mixed up, but whatever. Um, another thing um, that we found or that was observed is that phytosiderophores are exuded in what we call a diurnal rhythm. So there's a peak release period around lunchtime, so a few hours after the onset of light, um, when the plant is uh, metabolically most active. Can you go next? And next? Yeah. Um, and no, sorry, going back. Yeah, and this was just, it was supposed to be before the slide that I just had. This is just a confirmation um, that different species release different um, phytosterophores in terms of quantity, but also in terms of quality. And because this is, um, let's say, a Bali audience, I put this figure in, because here you can also see the reason why I chose to work with Bali in this project. Um, or one of the main reasons is that Bali is really the, the champion of, of phytosiderophore exudation. So it releases um, more phytosiderophores than any other grass crop that we investigated so far, I have to say. 
and it also has the, the, the most diverse mix of fighters and air force exuded. Can you go next? We also know the, the, the biosynthetic path, pathway, so the genes that are involved in, in phytosider for um, biosynthesis. Can you go next? So we have the precursor genes, the SAMS, NAS, and NAT. So from um, phytosider fours are uh, biosynthesized starting from methionine, and then nicotiana, nicotianamine. Um, is the, the true precursor, so to say, and then the DMAS gene converts nicotinamine into DMA, which is always the first phytosider for that is biosynthesized, and then the IDS genes convert DMA into the other phytosider force that are then exuded. Can you go next? And we also know the transport genes, so the most important ones for phytosider for exudation is the TOM1 gene, and for the reuptake of the iron metal or metal phytosider for complex is the yellow stripe one gene. Next, please. So we know quite a lot, as I said, but still there is surprisingly little data about phytosider force out there, like in terms of who is exuding what and, and, and how efficient are they in, in, in mobilizing micronutrients. And the reason for this is, is that these phytosider force are not commercially available. You cannot buy them. And it, makes researching them really difficult because you don't have any standards to start off with to develop your your analysis to i don't know do some batch experiments to do anything you just don't have the compounds available so that makes researching them really really difficult next please and it's and that's the reason why i started this whole project by collaborating with very clever people from the technical university of vienna um, from the Institute of Applied Synthetic Chemistry. So my collaboration partners developed a very clever puzzle-like synthesis approach to, to chemically synthesize all eight phytosiderophores, either with or without 13C label. Can you go next? And having these compounds finally in our hands, we were able to set up our analytical um, method uh, using an LCAZM-SMS approach that now really allows us to accurately identify, but also quantify um, phytosidera force. And this was really kind of the point where we could start to actually work on, on the research questions that were interesting for us. Can you go next, please? Yeah, so as I said, this brings me to my research question next. And the, so I'm going to, um, to talk about, or I'm going to address three different research questions today. I'm going to start off with, can you go next, please? I'm going to start off with um, the first questions that we had is, and the, this one was, um, to what extent is this um, phytosiderophore pathway triggered in Bali under either iron zinc or copper starvation? Because if you remember, um, we found these differences in, in complex, uh, metal complex stability for iron, zinc, and copper. And we were wondering, you know, whether these, I mean, it's known for iron, but it's not so much known for zinc and copper, whether these micronutrients trigger phytosiderophore, the phytosiderophore pathway, and if yes, to what extent. Can you go next, please? Okay, and I said I'm a soil person, but I have to confess in this, um, in this scenario, I prefer to work with hydroponics. And the reason for this is that I really couldn't find a soil where I can simply switch on and off different micronutrient deficiencies. So there are some experiments where it's really better to work in hydroponics, especially when it comes to these proof principle experiments. So what we did in this hydroponic experiment is we grew two bare barley genotypes, one that we know is micronutrient efficient and one that we know that is micronutrient inefficient. And we grew these two genotypes first for 12 days under, in a control nutrient solution with full nutrient supply. And then we exposed always um, six replicates to either copper, iron or zinc starvation for 20 four days, or we kept another set in control conditions. And by starvation, I mean, we completely omitted um, the micronutrient from the nutrient solution. And after the 36th day, we collected root exudates um, and we sampled root tissue for gene expression analysis by RNA-seq. 
and then we harvested the biomass and determined the micronutrient uptake. Next, please. And here is what we found. So first of all, so this graph shows you the phytos there for exudation rates per gram road dry weight um, per hour that we got from our exudation analysis. And here you can see, first of all, that clearly iron is the strongest trigger for, um, for the phytosiderophore pathway, followed by zinc and then also by copper to a slightly weaker extent. And another important thing that you can see here is that the phytosiderophore pathway expression is generally stronger in the efficient line, irrespective of, of the treatment we look at. Um, can you go next? And our exudation data was actually very nicely um, supported by our gene expression data. So you can see here um, the phytosidera for precursor biosynthesis genes, the biosynthesis genes, and they always show the same trend. So we have the strongest expression on the iron deficiency followed by zinc and then by copper. And in general, the expression is stronger in the efficient line compared to the inefficient line. Can you go next, please? And the same is true for the phytosidera for release genes and the reuptake and internal transport genes. Next, please. So that was about phytosidera for quantity and <laughs> it's about phytosidera for quality. Because interestingly, what we also observed was that the, the composition, the mixture of, or the relative contribution to the total phytosidera for to the total amount of phytos therefore released um, differed depending on genotype but also depending on micronutrient deficiency. So the main phytos therefore exuded in these two barley lines was EpiHMA. However, depending on, on, on genotype and, and micronutrient deficiency, we um, the relative contribution of MA, Epi, HDMA and DMA was also somewhat different. And what we found, can you go next please? And what we found was that this must somehow be related to the expression ratio of these two IDS genes, so IDS3 to IDS2, because we had a higher expression ratio um, in the efficient genotype and a lower um, and more MA and more MA exuded in terms in relative terms compared to the inefficient genotypes where we had a stronger EpiHDMA um, exudation. So it seems that the ratio of expression here plays a role in this. Can you go next, please? Yeah, and just um, because it's interesting, so to say we also found some other genes that were affected by, by our different micronutrient deficiencies. So we found some iron responsive genes, some, the, some quite known transcription factors that also reacted under um, zinc and copper deficiency. To, however, to a lower extent, some zinc responsive genes from the zip family, um, some copper responsive genes from the copper family, and also quite interesting, some heat shock protein coding genes that also showed, um, that showed actually an especially strong expression on the zinc deficiency. Can you go next, please? Okay, so now we know, yes, the phytosiderophore pathway is triggered most strongly on the iron, but also under zinc and copper starvation, which is really something that has not been shown before. But now the question is, we've seen that the different genotypes and different micronutrient deficiency trigger kind of the release of different phytosiderophore patterns. And the question is, does this matter for the plant? So does the phytosiderophore or do phytosiderophores differ in their micronutrient mobilization efficiency? Can you go next, please? And as we now have our, our compounds available and we can do um, some batch experiments with them, we, we did exactly that. So we took a zinc deficient soil and, and did a time series and we added always um, 50 micromolar um, phytosider, a 50 micromolar concentration of our different eight different phytosiderophores in a one-to-one -one ratio to, to our soil. We also added sodium azide to um, get rid of any microbial activity. And then we incubated our, our um, phytosiderophores for either half an hour, one hour, two, six, 24, 48, or 96 hours. Can you go next, please? Next, please. It's not working. 
at least. Okay, here we are. So, and this is what we found. So what you can see is that the metal mobilization efficiency really differs depending on the phytosidera for we used. Can you go next, please? So there is um, a group of phytos. So first of all, iron is um, solubilized or, or mobilized the strongest in this soil um, by most phytosidera fours, except for this um, three phytosidera fours that I, I highlighted here um, in, in, in red that show a rather low affinity for iron, but a higher affinity for kappa, which was, uh, sorry, for, for nickel in this case, which was very interesting to see. Can you go next? And another thing that was interesting to see, irrespective of phytosidera for applied, in this soil, nickel outcompetes iron with time. So we start off quite strong with iron um, solubilization, but then over time, nickel outcompetes iron. And this seems to be linked to the overall available metal pool in this specific soil. So, and this is usually determined in soil science by DTPA, by DTPA extraction. So DTPA is also a, a, sign, a synthetic ligand that complexes micronutrients. And when you extract your soil with DTPA, in this case, we see that the iron pool is the largest already followed by nickel. So this seems to play a role here. Can you go next? Yeah, and another thing that we also found that was quite depressing actually is that in the zinc deficient soil where, you know, the plant needs zinc the most, zinc mobilization was actually quite low. Can you go next, please? So time apparently matters um, for the plants but also of course concentration matters so we also um, did an experiment where we added different um, concentrations to our soils and we incubated them for one hour because we believe that's kind of the time frame that really matters for the plant can you go next and here i'm just going to show you the results for APHMA. overall the let's or let's say the general trend is the same for all phytosiderophores investigated and in this experiment, we also included another soil, a soil from Spain, from Santomera, um, that is iron deficient. And in this soil, you can see that this copper, that copper is um, mobilized um, to the greatest extent. In comparison, however, in the, in the zinc deficient soil, again, we found um, iron to be mobilized um, most strongly. But the the even though we add the same concentration, so we added increasing concentrations. So the mobilization, of course, increased with inc increasing concentration, but it still very much depended on the soil, which micronutrient was mobilized to the greatest extent. Can you go next? And this seems to be determined by the available metal pool. Again, you can see here that with the DTPA extraction results, that copper has the greatest pool in, in the Santomero soil, and this is reflected by the, by the phytosterophore data. And for the Sultanu soil, it's iron that is the greatest um, pool. But of course, the metal complex stability also plays a role in the mobilization patterns. So it in terms so in terms of, of metal mobilization, it seems to matter which phytosiderophore is released, but also in which soil the plant grows. Can you go next, please? So what does this mean for the plant? Now, if we look at, um, if we look at how much of the phytosiderophores we added are actually present as metal complexes. So what do they see as a, as a metal complex in the soil solution? Here you can see that something between 25 and 50% of the phytosiderophores we added um, are actually present as, as phytosiderophore metal complexes. So this is what the plant can actually then take up again. And all the rest is either present as a free ligand or is absorbed to the soil matrix. So this means the plant would probably only see a, a small fraction of what is actually released. Can you go next? And not just that, because of course, when you work in, in soil, there are always the microbes there that are very, how to say, they very much like these um, low molecular weight organic compounds. So it's a very attractive food source for them. So microbial decomposition is also going to play a role. Can you go next? 
And this is very new data, um, but I still wanted to show you because I think it matters here a lot. Um, so because we have our 13C um, fighters at Air Force, we, we did batch incubation experiments to trace their fate under non-sterile conditions. And in this case, we worked in rhizosphere soil because this is where the fighters at Air Force will end up when plants release them into the soil. So we, we collected rhizosphere soil and then we incubated the individual 13C label phytos um, uh, Then we added these individual 13C um, phytos to the soil, incubated it for either 1, 3, 6, 24, 48 or 96 hours. We took gas samples um, to measure, to measure the, the 13CO2 respired. And after 24 hours, we also looked at the 13C phospholipid fatty acid um, concentration in the soil. So phospholipid fatty acid are microbial biomarkers um, that are used to, that allows you to determine um, which microbial groups um, are responsible for the, for the, for the phytos and therefore decomposition. So you can tell whether it's gram-positive, gram-negative or, or fungus that, that does the trick, so to say. Next, please. And as I said, these are very new results and we are still trying to make sense of them. But we found some very striking patterns because here you can see the, 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 the percentage of phytosidera forests that are respired to CO2 with time. And we can see two distinct groups. So there's one group that is respired rather quickly. And then there is another group that is respired much slower. And can you go next, please? And the interesting things this is, is that it seems to be connected to the structure, to the chemical structure of the phytosidera force, because it's this, um, unfortunately, I don't have the pointer, but if you go to this upper group with the red and um, the yellow western fragment, it's this acetidine group with the, um, together with the hydroxyl group um, that seems to be responsible for this faster decomposition. Can you go next? But the question here is, is it really faster decomposition or is it simply weaker sorption? So kind of a higher bioavailability also for the microbes, but does the trick. And this is something that we are currently investigating. Can you go next? Yeah, so this, this soil data really shows you that it matters for the plant, which phytos are there for they release and how much they release into the soil. So the real question now is, does this trait, um, so, or does this, and does an upregulation of this um, phytos are for pathway is actually a trait that is relevant for micronutrient deficient crops. So is this a trait worth um, looking at or looking for when it comes to plant breeding? Can you go next, please? And to start answering these questions, um, we went back to soils. Um, we did a growth trial with four different bare genotypes, um, two with a high micronutrient deficiency, one with a medium and one with a low micronutrient deficiency. And in this growth trial, we grew our four genotypes on a zinc deficient soil from Turkey and on a copper deficient soil from Australia, and we also grew our plants on their respective fertilized controls. We had three sampling time points, either 18, 13, 32 or 48 days after germination. And we looked at biomass, micronutrient content and wood exudates. Can you go next, please? And this is what we found. So first, let's focus on the zinc deficient soil and on, on, on the zinc shoot um, uptake. So all the figures that I'm going to show you, um, so the genotypes, I, I ordered them in, in, in decreasing with the decreasing micronutrient deficiency. So the genotypes on the left-hand side are the efficient ones and the genotypes on the right-hand side are the inefficient ones. So you could see that with increasing growth or plant development, so first there's no real um, treatment effect and also no genotype effect after 18 days of growth. But after 32 and 48 days, we see a significant effect um, of our 
zinc treatment, but also we have a significant genotype effect with the two efficient genotypes um, taking accumulating more zinc compared to the inefficient um, genotype, irrespective of whether or not we are in the high or low zinc treatment. Can you go next, please? And this is what our phytosterophore exudation rates looked like. So initially, the rate, the phytosterophore exudation rates are quite high, but they are also quite random. So we don't have, we neither have a genotype nor a, a treatment effect. However, after 32 days, we have a clear um, treatment, but also a clear genotype effect again with, um, so first of all, with all, almost all genotypes um, showing higher exudation under zinc deficient conditions. Um, but most importantly, our two efficient genotypes show stronger, a stronger expression of the phytosiderophore pathway, so a stronger exudation compared to the inefficient genotypes. Can you go next? And now the same story, just for the same plants growing under the same conditions, but just in the copper deficient soil. Here we also already see at an earlier growth stage uh, a genotype and treatment effect, but Overall, this effect is less strong compared to, to our zinc deficient soil. Can you go next? However, interestingly, when we look at the phytosiderophore exudation rates, we hardly see any, any phytosiderophore exudation. So the scale, I kept the scale the same and comparable to what we found. Um, so the scale on the, on the left-hand side, the exudation rate scale is the same as for the zinc deficient line. So we find a genotype effect, that is true, but we do not see a treatment effect. I mean, with some imagination at 32 days, we could say, okay, we have a genotype uh, treatment effect, but statistics says it's not significant. And overall, I think we can see that um, phytosis there for exudation doesn't, is not going to play a major role in this, um, under this, in this specific soil. Okay, can you go next? So this is actually already the end of my talk, um, and I'd like to circle back to the research question that I wanted to address. So the first one was, to what extent is um, the phytosiderophore pathway triggered in barley under, um, under iron, zinc, and copper starvation? Can you go next? So we found the, the strongest response under iron deficiency followed by zinc, and then to the, to the same or minor, ex uh, weaker extent by copper, and we also observed um, a stronger upregulation in the efficient line compared to the inefficient line. And, our, and we also observed differences in, in which phytosiderophores were released. So not just in the quantity, but also in the quality. And that led us to, to the question whether it, the micronutrient mobilization efficiency differs for the different phytosiderophores. Can you go next? And here we found that, yes, that's the case. So it really depends on the phytosiderophore, but it also very much depends on the soil and of course on the concentration. So the more is released, the more will be mobilized. And we also observe differences in the decomposition dynamics of the different phytosiderophores. And then the million dollar question, is this um, is a strong expression of the phytosiderophore pathway a relevant trait in micronutrient efficient crops, especially when it comes to zinc and copper. Can you go next? So for copper, the evidence that we have so far, I would say no. And for zinc, the answer is a careful yes. Um, I mean, we've just looked at four genotypes and no, that's not a lot, especially when it comes to plant breeding. Um, I can tell you that we've already, let's say, expanded our selection and this confirmed our results, but I'm not ready to show them yet or to share these results yet so it's a careful yes yeah and with this i'm at the end of my talk can you go next please of course I, i'd like to acknowledge my wonderful project team andrea david ushua and ali reza they did an amazing job um, getting all this data of course i also need to acknowledge all my other collaboration partners especially tim and Joanne Russell from the James Hutton Institute, who were a wonderful support when it um, came down to selecting the genotypes um, we looked at. And last but not least, of course, the European uh, Research Council to give me all this money to do this work. 
Can you go next? Next, please. Ooh, that was too much. Sorry, one back. One back. One, yep. Yeah. And this is my thank you for your attention slide. So yeah, I'm at the end. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Thanks, Evie. That was great. Uh, you did so well, and then you show maze at the end. But hey, that's fine. Um, you yeah, they didn't have a good Bali picture. <laughs> um, yeah, really great, uh, great example of how Bali is so important when it comes to looking at uh, how we understand plant soil interaction. So thanks for that. Um, do we have any questions from the floor? While people are thinking, I will ask a question. Um, you mentioned at the start that Bali is really good at uh, producing phytosiderophores. Have you got any idea why that is the case? Why is barley, why barley particularly? Is it something about the way it evolved or? We really don't know. And I mean, we've started looking into this, but so far, I don't have any, any real answer to that question. It's just something that we observed, you know, we, and there's like, there's also not too much out there regarding different grasses. So, as I said, since it's so difficult to, to investigate these phytosiderophores, there's really not much known. It's just an observation that we made and I, I don't have any good explanation why that is. Okay. Uh, it'd be interesting to have a look at the, uh, perhaps have a look at the, the soils where they, where barley first evolved and things like that. Maybe it might be interesting to see what happens there. Um, Carmen. Hi, Eva. Very nice Hi, talk, um, and well, <laughs> I have learned a lot <laughs> with your talk. And I wonder if um, uh, are uh, if these uh, strategies, uh, strategy one and two that you talk about grasses and no grasses, uh, so they are combined also in barley. <laughs> so it could be that uh, Capor uh, it has other. Uh, so barley combined different strategies for acquiring these nutrients, not only. I mean, for, for copper and zinc, that's definitely the case. It's just for iron and here, the knowledge again, gets a bit sketchy. I mean, for example, for rice, it has been shown that it's kind of, uh, uh, can also employ, um, some strategy one mechanism, but so far, I think it's only rice where this has been shown for barley, from what I know, it's, it's really, and this is, this is really for iron. But, and for, for the other micronutrients, of course, other transporters will play a role as well. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to zinc, for example, this, I believe that this, um, enhanced pathway, phytosiderophore path, pathway expression could really make a difference for the plants mm -hmm. because it's not just, it's one thing to have, um, uptake transporters that are upregulated, but you can have the, the, the most upregulated transporters in the world, but if the mm -hmm. micronutrients are not available, it's not going to help you because, you know, there's nothing there mm -hmm. that you can actually take up. But what the phytosiderophores can do is they can mobilize the micronutrients from the soil, make it available. And then if you're then efficient at catching them, that mm -hmm. will really give you an advantage. So the advantage is not that you, because other organic acid, they are mobilizing these micronutrients, but it's really the re, uh, the reuptake in the plant what is helping. Uh, yes, this, because uh, yeah. because with the reuptake happens without complex dissociation, and especially with iron, you know, mm -hmm. the risk always when when you free the ligand from the iron is that iron precipitates immediately, what? because it's iron three. And then, you know, if, if it comes into contact with oxygen, it just precipitates and boom, it's not plant available anymore. That's why iron is so insoluble because mm -hmm. once oxygen is present, it's just, it just precipitates. That's it. That's what happens. But if it's complex with this ligand, that means it stays soluble in the, in the soil solution. It, and it stays available for plant uptake. And that's a huge advantage. And that's also kind of the benefit for zinc and, and copper because it can't, interact with the soil matrix. So it really stays soluble in the solution. So it really increases the pool of available, of, of micronutrients available for uptake. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, there's a question in the chat and then we'll go to Jesse uh, for a question from the floor. So a question in the chat from Marley. 
uh, have you looked at seeds to see if these micronutrients accumulate in response to various phytosidera for treatments? I'm not quite sure what you mean with phytosidera for treatments, but I can tell you that's how we selected our efficient and inefficient um, genotypes. So we were actually looking at the seeds um, and and determined the seed micronutrient content. And then we looked at the yield and the growth performance and, and kind of combined this. And we made sure that we like our definition of micronutrient efficiency was not just um, high uptake into the tissue, but actually high uptake into the seeds. So I'm very well aware that, you know, it's not just the uptake that matters here. There's also this internal partitioning and everything. But in the end of the day, to me, it's one of the traits that can help us um, to get more micronutrients into the seeds. And as I said, the most efficient internal partitioning is not going to help you if the plant does not get enough micronutrients from the soil. So it's really kind of a, a very important starting point, I would say. I hope Great. this answered your question. Yeah, perfect. So, um, Jesse, question. Uh, I was just wondering what happens in a situation where you've got um, an excess of a certain element. Does um, phytosidera for, um, do, does, it does its production get downregulated? Hmm. There are some studies on this, but they mainly focused, they never really measured phytosidera for production. They just measured the effect on the uptake of the toxic metal and that tended to increase. But there's not a lot of data out there on this. But I think it could, it could also be some protection mechanism because not all trace metals or not all metals, metal phytosidera for complexes are, are taken up to the same extent. And um, that answered your question, but I said, there's really not that much data out there because they are so difficult to investigate because you never have the compounds to work with. Okay. Thank you. So. Uh, I don't think there's any more questions just at the moment. I assume Carmen's hand is a hand that's left up from before. Um, so I think we'll probably bring the seminar to an end and thank Evie again for for a really stimulating uh, IBH seminar today. So thanks, Evie. Thank you for inviting me.